Malaria is said to be as old as the world. Found in Luxor, a papyrus dating back to 1500 before the Common Era alludes to an infection caused by a parasite that bears a striking resemblance to malaria. DNA tests run on Tutankhamun's mummy revealed that he was suffering from malaria at the time of his death. It was thought that the disease came from marshlands and areas where the air was foul. The French took the old word for marshland, palude, and called it paludisme. The Italians named it malaria, or mala aria, literally meaning bad air. The parasite was rife in Europe, and the devastation it caused was comparable to that it wreaks in Africa today. The 16th century saw the conquest of the New World and the beginning of the slave trade. Europeans loading African slaves into their ship's holds unwittingly imported malaria to the Americas. In 1630, Spanish Jesuit Don Francisco Lopez discovered the curative properties of the bark of a Peruvian tree called cinchona, which the Indians were already using to treat fever. The precious Jesuit powder was brought to Europe. In 1820, two French pharmacists, Pelletier and Caventou, isolated the quinine molecule from cinchona bark. In 1880, French doctor Alphonse Laveron was the first to observe under the microscope falciparum, the malaria parasite, in patients' red blood cells. In 1897, Englishman Ronald Ross also made a major breakthrough with his discovery of the Anopheles mosquito, which transmits the parasite to humans. Until the 20th century, quinine was the only anti-malarial drug. Chloroquine and other synthetic anti-malarials arrived at the beginning of the 1940s. At the same time, insecticides such as DDT were being sprayed extensively to eradicate anopheles. In 1955, buoyed by these early successes in fighting the disease, WHO launched its Global Malaria Eradication Program. But the parasite hit back by becoming increasingly resistant to treatment. In 2001, WHO advocated ACTs, a new treatment that combines artemisinin, a plant derivative already used by the Chinese in the 4th century, with one or two other anti-malarials. ACTs are extremely effective, but history is already repeating itself, as resistance to this new treatment has been observed in Asia. Malaria, which causes the death of over 500,000 people a year, is the world's principal parasitic disease. In 2013, 198 million people were infected, most of them in poor countries. Malaria affects around 100 countries, particularly those in tropical zones. Africa alone accounts for 90% of malaria cases, far more than Asia and the Near and Middle East. With over 20 million cases between them, Nigeria and Democratic Republic of Congo pay the heaviest price. In the last 10 years, deaths from malaria have been halved, especially in Africa. There are several reasons for this progress. Prevention, distribution of bed nets, spraying of insecticide, preventive treatment provided to pregnant women, and more particularly treatment with the advent of ACTs, new combination therapies containing artemisinin, a derivative of a Chinese plant. Even if the number of children becoming infected has also been halved, they are still the main victims. Every minute, one child under the age of five years dies of malaria. In 2013, 79 of the 88 countries where the parasite exists introduced these latest treatments, ACTs, into their health programs. Access to health care and screening are a real challenge in combating the disease. In Africa, 70% of patients could be treated with ACT antimalarials distributed in public health facilities. 
But as most children suffering with a fever never see a doctor, in 2013, only 26% were treated with ACTs. But like their forerunners, ACTs, therapies combining artemisinin with one or two other antimalarials, are coming up against the parasite's ability to adapt. Emerging resistance to ACTs has been reported recently in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, and Vietnam. The Anopheles mosquito, which thrives in tropical areas, is merely a means of transport, the vector that spreads malaria. The real culprit is the plasmodium, the parasite that the mosquito transmits. The female Anopheles bites at night to feed on human blood, and if its victim is already infected, the mosquito sucks in not only blood, but also numerous parasites. Once in the mosquito's gut, the parasites multiply, divide, and then move to the salivary glands. And when it bites again, the parasites invade the next victim's blood. The plasmodium undergoes multiple changes in the human body, from sporozoite to trophozoite to schizont, to merozoite, and lastly gametocyte. These metamorphoses enable it to circumvent the barriers of its host's immune system. The parasite's first stop on its journey through the bloodstream is the liver. At this stage, there is no immune response and the parasite is free to infect the liver cells and multiply. Until the point at which the liver cells rupture, releasing vast quantities of parasites into the blood and provoking the first symptom, shivering. The parasites then infect the red blood cells and quickly multiply, causing them to burst. A new generation of plasmodium contaminate the blood and it's their turn to be sucked in by a mosquito. The cycle has come full circle. The rupture of red blood cells results in fever spikes lasting several hours, which are characteristic of malaria. Shivering, fever, and sweating follow in cycles. The bouts of fever occur every two to three days. In the case of Plasmodium falciparum, Malaria can reach other organs, such as the brain, and become severe or even fatal. People who contract the disease several times acquire a partial immunity. Young children with developing immune systems and pregnant women whose immune systems alter during pregnancy are most at risk of severe and sometimes fatal malaria. To test for malaria, all you need to do is place a drop of blood from a finger prick on a test strip. With this rapid diagnostic test, doctors can act immediately. Microscopy is more complex, but more precise, and is used to identify the specific type and number of parasites. If left untreated for 24 hours, falciparum malaria, the most common type of malaria, can develop into severe, even fatal disease. But the parasite is generally resistant to single drug therapy. The most effective treatment is a combination of multiple drugs, including one derived from artemisinin, a substance extracted from a plant that has been used in Chinese medicine for more than 2,000 years. Combining an artemisinin derivative with another drug is a better way to combat the parasite. These combination drugs, referred to as ACTs, have been used since soon after the year 2000.
Generally, ACTs are well tolerated, reduce transmission, and patients recover in three days. However, for the past few years, a worrying trend has been seen. Resistance to artemisinin derivatives. The majority of these cases have been seen in Cambodia, Thailand, and Myanmar. As no new anti-malaria treatments are foreseen in the next five years, the development of resistance may be a serious threat in regions with endemic malaria. The main preventive measures against malaria are the use of indoor insecticides and insecticide-impregnated mosquito nets. Since 2011, seasonal malaria chemoprevention is also being used effectively in sub-Saharan Africa for children between the ages of three months and five years. A similar type of chemoprevention protects both mother and child when given to pregnant women. My children often get malaria. They get a fever, they get burning hot, then they have seizures, they vomit and have diarrhea. We came here to get the medication that prevents malaria. We understand how important this treatment is. That's why there are so many people here to get it. Thanks to a combination of anti-malarial drugs, effective for 28 days and distributed once a month, seasonal malaria chemoprevention has been responsible for an 80% reduction in malaria. Our research group at INSERM primarily works on malaria and within the field of malaria we are currently working more specifically on the different phases of malaria that occur before the parasite appears in the blood. It's essentially during the phase in the blood that the disease, sometimes fatal, occurs. Our idea is to identify drugs or to identify vaccines that would prevent the parasite from entering into the liver, that would prevent the development of the parasite within the liver, or even prevent it from leaving the liver. To conduct this type of research, we work with an insectorium where we breed female Anopheles, because it's only the female Anopheles that transmit malaria. We extract the parasites from the salivary glands of these Anopheles and we use them to infect either in vitro cultures that mimic the liver or to infect what we call humanized mice. Mice that are severely immunodepressed and into which we are able to transplant human cells. For many years, our research has been focused on Plasmodium falciparum because, as I tell medical students, with Plasmodium falciparum, you're either cured or you die. On the other hand, you can be infected with other Plasmodium species, for example with Plasmodium vivax. You don't die from Plasmodium vivax, or very infrequently. You may be very ill, but you don't die. However, months, even years after an infectious bite, you can have a relapse. Relapses are linked to the fact that when the parasite enters the liver, it can either multiply, like Plasmodium falciparum, or it can remain inside the liver in a dormant state. It's hypnotized, thus its name hypnozoite. Then at some point, months or years later, for reasons we are trying to understand, it wakes up, it multiplies, and it enters the bloodstream where it causes the disease. We are trying to identify medications that will kill these sleeping parasites. Currently, the only drug of this type is primaquine, which is a very effective drug, but it's toxic, especially in people lacking a specific enzyme. And in Africa, up to 30% of the population is lacking this enzyme. And we have another approach, which was discovered quite by accident. We've identified medications that will wake the dormant parasite. So we wake the parasite and it multiplies. And we have several medications that can kill the multiplying parasite. So the idea called 
wake and kill, is to revive the parasite and then, when it multiplies, to knock it out.